Hello, Spirit family, and welcome to Viral Revival. So excited to be joining you today again. It's always a pleasure gathering together, coming into the Word of God, acknowledging the presence of the Holy Spirit. So we're very thrilled about this broadcast today. It's all about the Holy Spirit. Now, I know I get accused often of talking about the Holy Spirit too much, but to be honest with you, I just can't help myself. I love, love, love the Holy Spirit. And I'm so glad that you're joining us from around the world. Let me take a look at some of the comments here. Nini says, woo, with the fire emojis. Christy, yes, with several S's. So they really mean it. Sabina Hernandez, welcome. We, we, we so appreciated, Sabina, your testimony where the Holy Spirit touched your life. Tremendous, tremendous testimony. If you haven't seen that yet, God delivered Sabina from a severe drug addiction and it was a powerful move of the Holy Spirit. She's now an evangelist, so make sure you take a look at that video that's up online right now. I see Sharoon Patrick is joining us. I see Carlos says, David and Vlad. Yes, 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 indeed, my good friend. Vlad Savchuk is joining us today on the broadcast. He, of course, also loves the Holy Spirit. So we're going to tag team it today. You're going to get both of us teaching you about the Holy Spirit. And I'm very thrilled that he's joining us in just a few minutes. By the way, because Vlad is in the chair today, Stephen will be interacting via the comment section. So Steve Moctezuma is actually in the comment section right now. He'll be interacting with you guys and he'll be, and, and Ruben, let's let's go ahead and help Steve out just in case he's having trouble accessing that. So uh, we'll make sure he gets in there. So oh, there he is. Uh, Stephen Moctezuma says, continue to share this video. And then the comment disappeared because you guys are amazing at spamming the chat, which is what we appreciate. Don't forget, make sure you gently click the like button. I promise you, it will be minimally satisfying. It's like this little thing that you get to watch happen, a transformation, a metamorphosis right there in front of you. Right in plain sight, you can see that boring, gray, lifeless, dull thumbs up button turn blue. And that's much more colorful, obviously, than gray. So go ahead, gently click the like button. It's actually going to help us with spreading our reach online. It's not actually something we just like you doing. It really does help the stream. And so um, when you like a video, it actually sends a signal to YouTube to say, hey, we, uh, we are getting a lot of traction on this. People are enjoying the video, and so it knows to send that video out. Um, so go ahead, click the like button right now. If you're watching, click that like button. Make sure you're doing that uh, so that you can help us spread our reach. And comment like crazy. Don't stop commenting. Make sure you leave a comment every few seconds. Leave two, three, leave 100 comments. It all helps us out. I'm so excited to be here, as I said. And I'll interact here a little more with some of the comments coming in. Carla Laskowski uh, leaving a laughing emoji. I assume that's in response to how I'm requesting you to click that like button. Joanne is here with us. Joanne, our prayer partner who helps to lead that prayer team. And then I see Frank Sun, Demon Slayers and Friends. Well, God bless you. Jessica LaPena is making use of those exclusive ETV emojis. And then I see Nini, some more emojis. Jessica, again, with some more emojis. I saw a Nick emoji in there somewhere. Maria Oliveira says, hello, David, Stephen, and Vlad. You guys are really doing a great job of bringing the comments in. Viola and Kim and Jaquin and Stacy and Bernard and Kenneth. Wow, look at all of these coming in from around the world. I can actually slow it down here in front of me on my computer. I can slow it down slightly. Margaret and Alicia, Jenny Lowell. Amber, Emily Laramore, our good friend, Jake, all of you joining us from around the world. We're so excited. By the way, before we get into this message, and I'm not going to take too much more time, remember to continuously like this video and remind people to like the video. Also, continuously comment. Do not stop with the comments. Yes, it makes all the difference in the world. You get us to a thousand likes before the live stream ends. We're going to do that book giveaway four books. And actually, you know what I'm going to do? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pull it from right off the shelf behind me here. In case you didn't notice, in the, uh, in the reaction video I did on Oral Roberts, uh, this book was there. We'll send you this, Spirit-Filled Jesus by Vladimir Savchuk. We're going to send you, will you, I'm sure he'll sign it for us. He's going to sign it. We'll send it to you. We'll include that in the book giveaway. So the book giveaway will be Carriers of the Glory, Encountering the Holy Spirit in Every Book of the Bible, 25 Truths About Demons and Spiritual Warfare, Praying in the Holy Spirit, and 
Spirit-filled Jesus. You can't beat that. All you got to do is get us to 1,000 likes before the live stream ends. And the way we pick a winner is very simple. Ruben, in his oh-so-mysterious ways, will randomly, at some point throughout the live stream, unbeknownst to us, select a winner from the comment section. So when you're commenting, every comment is a chance to win that book giveaway. So that's going to be five books we're sending your way from anywhere in the world. Participate, but more importantly, do it because you want to help us spread the gospel. Now, I want to tell you about a couple of events coming up, and then we're going to get right into the teaching. And I know it's going to bless you. We're going to, we're going to minister to you today. We're going to pray with you today. We're just going to let the power of the Holy Ghost move an online revival, like we say, viral revival, the Holy Spirit's live stream. So we do have some upcoming events that we're looking forward to. On Friday, August 20th, check this out. We are doing an online encounter service. Now, I know that we live stream our encounter services that we do around the world, and that's awesome. But did you know that we actually do a specific service just for the online community? So I will be 100% focused on ministering to those who are tuning in online on August 20th. So it's a healing service. I'm going to be preaching the word. We're going to be praying over the sick. Many of you can join by Zoom. I'll be able to see you and pray over you. It's going to be a powerful time. And we get huge responses to these wonderful services that happen and miracles occur. People get delivered. People get saved. People get healed. People get set free. People get filled with the Holy Ghost. So that's August 20th. That's a Friday. And it's going to take place right here on YouTube. So make sure you're subscribed. Click that notification bell when you do subscribe. That's very important as well. So that's Friday, August 20th. That's going to be an online encounter service. And then on Sunday, August 29th, we're going to be having our monthly encounter service. And at this monthly encounter service, we're actually going to be giving away bottles of anointing oil. Now, this isn't a gimmick. It's not something we do to draw in people. The people come regardless. They come from all over the world. They pack the buildings. Their spiritual faith soaring, ready to receive God's touch. But we want to turn this into an impartation service. We're going to be giving away these bottles of anointing oil. No power in the oil, but the scripture talks about releasing our faith through laying on the laying on of hands with oil. So we're going to be giving away these bottles of oil. We're going to be praying over those bottles of oil, and we're going to be praying over you. It's going to be an impartation service. Every person who wants prayer on that Sunday can come up and receive prayer. Of course, we pray for people all the time, but this is a special night where we're going to be focusing on impartation. Of course, the word will be preached. The sick will be ministered to. We'll worship the Lord together with Hundreds of believers from around the world who are hungry for God's touch and also will be praying for impartation. And last but not least on the event announcements, check this out. September 18th and 19th. This is a two-night miracle service. September 18th and 19th. We are coming to Denver, Colorado, and it will be a powerful time. It's going to be at the Aurora Denver Conference Center and this is going to be in Aurora, Colorado, which is technically Denver. So the Aurora Denver Conference Center in Aurora, Colorado. Check the ministry website for details. You can go to davidhernandezministries.com slash events to register for any of these events. All these events are free, but we encourage you to register. Registration is, of course, free as well. So davidhernandezministries.com slash events. Don't miss any of these meetings. The power of God has been moving in a very unique way. We are really seeing a unique move of the Holy Spirit in these meetings. And so I know you're going to want to be a part of that. So why don't we all in the comment section, welcome my brother in Christ, the wonderful, the gifted, the anointed Vlad Savchuk. Welcome to Viral Revival, my friend. Thank you, David. I'm honored to be here. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to be with you. And you're actually live here in studio with me. Right so here. you're in Steve's seat. So everybody, can we hear it for <laughs> Pastor Vlad? Hey, if your life has been impacted by Pastor Vlad 
and his testimony has touched your life, his preaching has touched your life, can you just let him know in the comment section? Let's just bless the man of God with some encouragement here. Look at all these people, Pastor Vlad, who love and appreciate the ministry. I know you do it for the Lord, but these people are touched and encouraged by your ministry, and we are so excited that you're here with us. So we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit, my friend. And I know that you have lots to say, but before we get into that, tell me a little bit about this book that you wrote, Spirit-Filled Jesus. Um, This book was really looking at Jesus, how he depended on the Holy Spirit, because a lot of times we all use our own personal examples of how we depend on the Holy Spirit. And that's good. There's nothing wrong with that. Our, Our experience can hold a lot of cues and clues on how somebody should walk with the Holy Spirit. But I think the best example that modeled that for us is Jesus. And so I go from his birth all the way till his ascension, every step of the way how Jesus depended on the Holy Spirit. And he didn't do it just to show off. He did it to show us an example of how we can do exactly the same. And so then I leave little practical tips on how we can apply that practically today in our life. And it's a very short read. I think it's like 30 or 40 pages. And so you can actually, those of you who've never finished a book since your, your <laughs> university or college, it can boost your self-esteem. <laughs> well, that, that alone is a good reason to buy it. You Come know. on, somebody. But you're actually, how can they actually get the book, uh, Spirit-Filled Jesus? Uh, they can get it on Amazon. Uh, they can get it also on Audible version. On Audible version, I actually read it for you. So all you got to do is just listen. I think it's like an hour and a half or an hour. And then you can get it on Kindle. You can get it on Apple Books. Or if you can't afford it, you can just go to pastorvlad.org. And right there on the homepage, you can download a free copy, no strings attached. And uh, it's just our gift to you. Okay, my friend. So the way this is going to work, I was telling Pastor Vlad, when I hear the Holy Spirit being talked about, it stirs my faith. It gets me excited. I start to think of all the wonderful truths about the Holy Spirit that's been revealed to me. So we're going to do this like almost like a ping pong game. He's going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Then I'm going to talk about the Holy Spirit back and forth and back and forth. And hopefully by the end of this, we're all just ready to go out and start preaching the gospel and living holy lives. And I'm just very excited. Whenever we talk about the Holy Spirit, I feel like I come to life. This is just the Holy Spirit is the key the secret to the, to the Christian life as it was intended to be. Mm-hmm. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers you to pray, who gives you boldness in evangelism, who helps you walk in holiness, helping you to overcome sin and the selfish nature. The Holy Spirit is the one who inspires within us true worship that comes from revelation. For the scripture says, they that worship him will worship in spirit And in truth, the Holy Spirit takes that which we know of God and causes it to become revelation. That Mm -hmm. revelation inspires in us heartfelt worship as we lavish it upon the Lord. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps you to understand the word. As you read the scripture, the very one who inspired every word is with you and he will teach you the word as you commit yourself to knowing the word. The Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit is, as I said, the secret to the Christian life. Now, one of the things I wanted to discuss, and then Pastor Vlad, you can jump in too at any moment. I wanted to discuss this first topic because we're going to cover these four things. Number one, how to know you have the Holy Spirit. A lot of believers want to know, do I have Mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit? Is he in me? Did I say something that offended him and caused him to leave? Mm -hmm. The second thing we're going to cover is how to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. What can you actually do to begin to position yourself to carry the anointing of the Holy Ghost? Number three, how Jesus modeled a life of power. And this right here, I think we're going to glean a lot of truths from that wonderful book, Spirit-Filled Jesus. And then I want to talk to you about how to receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. How do you receive this fresh touch of God's Holy Spirit's power upon your life. So, how to know you have the Holy Spirit. Number one, the first key to knowing that you have Mm. the Holy Spirit is found in Romans chapter 8, verse 16. Romans 8, 16 says this, For His Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm 
that we are God's children. I'll read the verse prior because there's a lot of power in that too. Mm -hmm. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Mm -hmm. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. So the Holy Spirit joins with our spirit. Mm -hmm. to affirm that we, in fact, belong to God. This is a question that many believers ask because they're fearful that their mistakes have caused the Holy Spirit to leave them. But remember that the Holy Spirit is more patient than you are sinful. He's so more good. persistent than you are stubborn. Mm. He's more loving than we are evil. And the Holy Spirit works with us. He guides us and he gives us this deep conviction because conviction is not just feeling sorry for something that you did that was wrong. Conviction rather is a deeply held belief that's rooted so deeply within your spirit that that belief becomes a part of you. And so the Holy Spirit convicts us not just of sin, but of God's righteousness and coming judgment, meaning the Holy Spirit reveals to us. He convinces us. He causes us to be established in the truth that we belong to him. He's that inner witness, the one who mm. affirms to us that we belong to God. And it may not always mm. feel this way. Sometimes we may feel because we messed up, because we made mistakes, that we don't belong to the Lord. But I like to say this to people who feel like they've gone too far and who feel like they're fakes. The good news is you are a fake, but not in the way that you see it. Mm. You see, when we sin... We're not fake believers. We're not fake children of God. When we fall into sin, we're fake sinners. Come we're on. not wolves in sheep's clothing. Mm. We're sheep in wolves' clothing. Pastor Vlad, mm. I'm sure you've encountered this a lot, people wondering if they have the Holy Spirit in them. Mm. I like that. I'm already receiving. I want to take notes right now. Uh, but fake. I'm a fake sinner when I sin as a Christian. That's so good. That's so good. You got to drop that in the chat, somebody, right there and then. Um, I, I agree with you. I think one of the statements that I heard when you mentioned, David, in the previous videos or your teachings, that at salvation, we receive the Holy Spirit. And during the baptism uh, into the Holy Spirit, we release the Holy Spirit. I think a lot of people, when they grow up, especially in the very traditional Pentecostal circles, where receiving the Holy Spirit was associated with speaking in tongues. Hmm. Or if you don't speak in tongues anymore, you no longer have the Holy Spirit. Or if you don't feel the Holy Spirit, you don't have the Holy Spirit. And though there are verses in Book of Acts where apostles would come to particular churches and say, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And then we see when they prayed for them, they spoke in tongues. And, and almost like it seems like there's a disconnection when you speak in tongues, that's when you receive the Holy Spirit. But as we dive deeper, as in the verse that you shared, uh, I would like to share one verse in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Mm. It says the following, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, have been made to drink into one spirit. Before there's a baptism with the Holy Spirit, uh, there's a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is when the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Jesus to make you part of his body. You don't become part of the body of Jesus Christ. You don't become a Christian. You can't become born again without the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes you, and Paul says in Corinthians, he says that he baptizes us into one body. So not only he makes me you know, born again, but he makes me part of Jesus' body, and that is his baptism. He does that into the body of Jesus. And then Jesus baptizes me into the Holy Spirit. That's when I walk in power, receive the anointing, and fulfill my calling. Nobody can become a Christian without the Holy Spirit. Jesus clearly stated, he says, unless you're born in John chapter 3, verse 5, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. When you were born first time, devil gave you a gift. It was called the flesh. You, Unfortunately, you and I, we have opened that gift and we've been using it since. The gift that keeps on giving. The gift that keeps on giving and unfortunately messing up our life. But when you were born again, God the Father gave you and me a gift, 
at the moment of our salvation, not a day later, not a week later, not after we graduate Bible college, not when we even get water baptized, finish membership classes and sign up to serve at our local church, not when we quit this, quit that, or do this or do that. But at that moment, when you were born again, that act was already done by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. But also you received a gift and this gift is the person. You didn't receive um, a ghost or an, an, a, a cloud or you received a person, a third person of Trinity that came to dwell inside of your spirit. And God the Father did not take that spirit away. God the Father did not, we cannot grow to become Christians without the help of the Holy Spirit. And why I love the Holy Spirit is because I get a chance today to have the same relationship with the Holy Spirit that disciples had with Jesus. Wow. And it's so incredible. That's powerful. That Jesus says, unless I depart, he says, he will not come and it will be to your advantage. And I remember when this became real to me, that as a Christian, I already spoke in tongues, uh, you know, growing up in Assemblies of God Church, but not understanding that I can actually have the same relationship with this person that disciples had with Jesus. So I want to encourage you, how do you know that you have the Holy Spirit? The same way that you know if you have Christ, if you have salvation. The scripture says that, that if we believe in Him, we repent of our sins, we place our trust in Him, that God will give us the Holy Spirit. And we, tr we take that by faith. We don't take that because we, we were slain, because we spoke in tongues, because we felt a fuzzy feeling. All of these are results. But we take it by faith that He lives within us and then He begins to witness to our spirit, like David mentioned, that we are the children of God. That's so powerful. Can you say that again, that dynamic of the relationship? That we can have the same relationship with the Holy Spirit that disciples had with Jesus. That is such... If you remember that, disciples didn't pray revelation. to Jesus. They, there were only a few occasions where disciples prayed to Jesus or worshipped Him. Because a lot wow. of people ask this question, you know, can I worship the Holy Spirit? Or, uh, you know, should I pray to the Holy Spirit? Even though we're instructed to pray to the Father in, his, in Jesus' name by the power of the Holy Spirit. But I always ask them, I said, did dis do disciples, the disciples pray to Jesus? They're like, well, kind of, but they didn't have to. Why? Because they could fellowship with Him. Hmm. They did not need to worship Him. They did. They claimed, they proclaimed Him as God as Christ, they said, you are Messiah. But if you look at the context of their relationship, there's one word you could use to do that. They walked, lived, they fellowshiped. No wonder in Corinthians it says, may the communion, may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. That's why Jesus says, he will be another, meaning he will take my place. You can be with him, you can do to Him, you can talk to Him, you can live with Him, walk with Him, fellowship with Him, as the 12 disciples did that with Jesus. So what you're talking about, what you're describing, can be so life-transforming if Amazing. someone just captures that. Because I remember I was having a conversation with a friend of mine. I used to go to a Baptist school. You and I, Pastor Vlad, were talking about this at lunch. So I used to attend a private Baptist school. So I got really solid Bible teaching, but there were also some things that contradicted, of course, what I believed as a charismatic believer. And I remember one time talking to one of my friends and I was talking about how the night before I had been in prayer and talking with the Lord and how God spoke to me about something and it really helped give me breakthrough in certain areas of my thinking. And he's listening to me and he goes, what do, you, what, do you mean you, what do you mean God spoke to you? I said, God, God spoke to me. The Holy Spirit spoke to me. Like he, the, the, I call it the whisper to my heart. The mm -hmm. Holy Spirit spoke these words and it helped me. He goes, you mean like you read it in the Bible? I said, well, that's, that's the primary way we hear him. I said, but he also has these whispers to my heart that he gives me. And he goes, so, so what do you mean? He goes, you, you say you talk with God? I said, yes. I said, I know him. He said, you, he, he, goes, he just couldn't understand. He goes, no, 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 you mean you know about him. You read, him, you read about scripture. I go, no, I know him. Like he's my friend. We talk. And he had the most puzzled look on his face. 
And what I didn't realize then that I realize now, which is why I'm so passionate about sharing about the Holy Spirit, is that people, believers, don't understand the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Some do, mm. many do not. And it's a missing element of Christianity mm. that I am so passionate about helping people discover. Friendship with the Holy Spirit mm. will change your life. Because as we were talking yeah. about, the Holy Spirit does, in fact, give us that confidence in our salvation. That's, that's one of the most fundamental things. And I think it's so important. You had brought this up, and it got me thinking on this track. You know, there are believers who struggle. And I know this is somewhat of a cliche to say, but it's true. There are believers who struggle with their identity in Christ. They wonder, who am I in Christ? Am I forgiven? Am I accepted? Do I belong? And you may mm -hmm. attend church, look around the room and all of the other people worshiping and question whether or not you belong in that group in the first place. And if you're not careful, you begin to look for your identity in the things of this world, maybe your ministry, maybe what you do for God. Mm -hmm. And so there rests this question in your heart, unsettled. Do I belong to him? Am I truly his? Because sometimes I feel like I do, and other times I feel like I don't. This is why we as believers cannot wait for our feelings to confirm what our faith should cause us to know. We cannot wait mm -hmm. for our feelings to confirm what our faith should cause us to know. Mm -hmm. And the Holy Spirit gives us this confidence. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is that inner witness saying to you, you are not an orphan, you belong to God. He causes us to cry, the scripture says, to shout, mm -hmm. to declare, to emphasize, Abba, Father, mm -hmm. I belong to you. I am yours. Mm -hmm. You own me. I am completely in your hands care and the holy mm. spirit does that only the holy spirit does that mm. and so this inner witness becomes a guide yes. a foundational truth that we follow in our everyday lives now some believers get confused and this has actually been a point of confusion for a lot of christians right here because they'll look at sort of the timeline of their spiritual journey and they'll point to when they got saved and then they'll point to when they had some encounter with God where they were empowered by the Holy Spirit in a fresh way. And they say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. They look back at their timeline and they go, okay, when in fact did I receive the Holy Spirit? Because I know I was saved on this date or during this time in my life, mm. but I can't quite pinpoint when I received the Holy Spirit. And so mm. we get lost in the lingo. We say, mm -hmm. well, well, you need to receive the Holy Spirit. And sometimes when I say you need to receive the Holy Spirit, people hear you need to receive the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues is wonderful, but receiving the Holy Spirit is not the same thing as receiving the gift of tongues. Mm -hmm. And so there's this confusion that arises. They look back at that moment and they say, okay, I was saved then, but then what happened afterwards is kind of a blur to them. So let's clarify this for a second. Romans 8, 9 makes it very clear that no one can be saved without the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. John chapter 7, verse 38, Jesus talks about living water springing forth mm -hmm. from your inner man, receiving the Holy Spirit in that way. And so at salvation, I receive him. Mm -hmm. But this is not the same as the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I think once we understand that there are two events described in Scripture, then it sort of takes away the confusion. Because the moment you are saved, you have him and he has you. Otherwise, mm -hmm. Ephesians is lying when it says that the Holy Spirit is the seal of salvation because salvation is a work of the Spirit. Therefore, I cannot be saved without the Holy Spirit. I don't yes. even belong to God without the Holy Spirit. So let's settle that matter using Scripture. Ephesians 1, Romans 8, 9, and others make it very clear that when I am saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live in me. Mm -hmm. I belong to him. I'm his vessel. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? He comes to dwell in me, not for a visitation. Mm -hmm. He makes me a habitation. Come I on. become his dwelling place. He abides with me. Okay. So that happens at salvation. Then what begins to happen is as you surrender to the Holy Spirit, he begins to take over more aspects of your life. And this is what we call immersion or baptism with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Therefore, mm -hmm. 
Baptism with the Holy Spirit is not rain from above. Mm. It's a flood from within. And mm. so at salvation, I receive him. At baptism, I release him. And so gain the confidence in knowing that once you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. The question is, does the Holy Spirit have you? So good. Have you surrendered those pockets mm. of your life to him? Are the flood waters indeed filling those empty spaces that we've yet to surrender to his mm -hmm. influence? Are those floodwaters affecting the outer man? He lives in my inner man. He that is joined with the Lord is one spirit within the scripture declares. So I'm one with him, but how is that inner reality influencing and affecting my outer experience? And that is the, the essence, the nature, the basis of what we call the baptism with the Holy Spirit. So at salvation, I receive him. Mm -hmm. At baptism, I release mm -hmm. him. And then he begins to bring out these things that you were talking to me about, Pastor Vlad, when you talked about walking with him like the disciples walk with Jesus. That's why it stirred me up, because you touched on really a core thought there. That is a, a core truth that I think every believer should know, that, that with the Holy Spirit, it's not like you know the Lord. You know him. Mm -hmm. You love him. He's your friend. So I appreciated that you, you brought that up. So... On this notion of knowing that you have the Holy Spirit, that's number one, confidence in your salvation. Mm -hmm. What are some other signs, Pastor Vlad, that you've seen that indicate that someone actually has the Holy Spirit? Not necessarily the baptism with the Holy Spirit. We'll touch on that in mm -hmm. a moment. Mm -hmm. But that the Holy Spirit lives in them. It, I would say the fruit of the Spirit becomes really the... It's, it's even... See, that's why it's called the fruit of the Spirit meaning it's the sign of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. The Holy Spirit is with us before we get saved so that we can get saved. According to, you know, John chapter 16, verse 8, He comes to convict us of sin. He convicts the world. He convicts of righteousness, sin, righteousness, and judgment. So He's with every person who doesn't even know Jesus Christ so He can bring them to salvation. But once He comes to live in us, something begins to happen the fruit begins to develop. The fruit of His presence, the fruit of His indwelling begins to appear. What is that fruit? That fruit is not casting out of demons. That's, that fruit is not healing of the sick. That fruit is not uh, evangelism even. Uh, that fruit of indwelling of the Holy Spirit is, as mentioned in Galatians chapter 5, it deals with our character, it deals with our attitude. I find it interesting, David, that Jesus spoke to his disciples in John chapter 14, verse 17, mm -hmm. and he speaks of the Holy Spirit, and he says, he dwells with you, and he will be in you. So, very clear distinction that the Holy Spirit was not in the disciples yet, explains some of their character problems. Hmm. They had plenty of them. I mean, from the Last Supper, you know, debating who's gonna be first, to Peter always saying something out of line, to Peter denying Jesus three times and cursing and, you know, like doing all of this stuff, going back to his old life in fishing. But then when Jesus resurrected and he came back, and we see that in John chapter 20, verse 22, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. We know that this was not the baptism in the Holy Spirit because they didn't speak in tongues. They didn't receive the power yet, but they received the Holy Spirit. Almost reminds me of that story in the book of Genesis where God breathed into the corpse wow. of Adam and he became a living soul. So now God breathes, God the Son breathes into his disciples. The Holy Spirit comes to live in them. And what is the one sign we see from that point on? is faithful, loyal commitment to Jesus Christ. We didn't see that for three and a half years. We, we saw them wavering. We saw them doubting. We saw them complaining. We saw them doing a lot of other things, like want to bring fire in Samaria. I mean, there was a lot of character flaws. And I'm not in any way indicating that after the Spirit of God came to dwell in them, they became perfect. But they started to become perfected. Mm. Something from the within started to aid them to develop these characteristics that resembled the heart of Jesus, it became natural to become loving. It became natural, like you said, 
when you do the sin you become fake because it's against your nature now and so I believe that the sign of the Spirit of God living in the person is what the Bible talks about in Galatians the the fruit of that is love is patience and it you have to understand one thing about fruits is that fruits first of all it doesn't say fruits in Galatians chapter 5 I'm gonna correct myself it says fruit right. all of the nine characteristics are summarized with one fruit I believe the reason why is because anyone can try to work on them at one at the expense of another only the Holy Spirit can produce all of them at once without one at the expense of another and this is a fruit of the Spirit it's not work of discipline toil of prayer striving of fasting the pressure of me setting boundaries me forcing myself that's work of the flesh that's not fruit of the Spirit so one of the things that I teach Christians which comes off first wrong and so I discourage you to make a sound bite from this because it, it's going to come out wrong is don't work on your character work on your intimacy with the Holy Spirit that's good and he by the default naturally by his indwelling presence will be affecting your attitude a fruit indicates it starts sour before it becomes sweet fruit indicates it doesn't appear immediately it grows gradually the Holy Spirit will begin to give you these impulses these desires these cravings for holiness for righteousness for patience for kindness for long-suffering for self-control I've tried this to me has been such a revolutionary secret to my Christian life that removed striving from my Christian life I would say that portion of my Christian life was filled with striving I am by nature more of a disciplined person I like to wake up early I like to discipline myself and that slept slipped into my Christian walk with the Holy Spirit where I felt like the more pressure I put in to try to act this particular way the more pleasing I will be to him the interesting part is that the more I put in to work on my character the worse my character became it just it never worked and I almost felt like I was exhausted I was tired trying to become a Christian my Christian life could be summarized in one word striving and when I discovered that the Holy Spirit lives in me he wants to take the credit for creating a character he wants this character to be a fruit of his presence something happened to me I can remember this incident it happened in my garage where I internally came to the point where I was tired tired of trying to please God I was exhausted of remembering everything I have to do to please him okay the remembering part was tired <laughs> I was tired remembering everything I had to do so that my wife is happy all of that being a good pastor being a good boss being a great husband all of this stuff I was like God I am tired of all the hats I'm wearing and I forget which hat is when God I'm exhausted and I remember this one conversation I had in the garage is the most spiritual conversation I had with God I said God I quit <laughs> I said God I'm done I can't take it anymore I quit living for you and I ask you please live through me that's the prayer I prayed see how I got saved is I trusted in his death for me how do I get sanctified I have to yield his life in me what I was doing is I got the salvation by substitutionary death I tried to achieve sanctification that is so by good. my own striving and I realized there is no way I can be sanctified without allowing him to live but for him to live I have to quit so what is quitting it's called surrender what quitting is sounds negative but it's actually I surrendered I remember I walked that day I declared it to my wife she kind of got shocked at first I said I quit being good I am done trying to be a good husband I said like, I can't do it 
I'm horrible at it. But I'm like, from this day forward, I'm, I'm going to let the Holy Spirit remind me to bring you flowers. <laughs> I'm going to let the Holy Spirit remind me to be kind. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit remind me to be a good person. And when this is going to happen, I cannot take the credit. It will be His fruit, not my efforts. Because up to this point, it was all my prayer, my fasting, my striving, my reminders. I mean, I, it was me. And therefore, he couldn't do anything because I was getting the credit. And honestly, my wife started to notice generosity. She started to notice kindness. And I'm not saying I'm perfect in any way. But if I could use one word, I would say I am more surrendered today than before. And Christian life became a yoke that's not burdensome and hard. And that is what I see as sign of the Spirit of God dwelling in the person. That is the fruit. That fruit. And it's interesting that you began to talk about it. That was where I wanted to take it. So you're definitely in the in the right vein here i really do sense a flow of the spirit we as are we in share. the same room david yeah so there, there's come. a there's a beautiful flow here come on and you know i look through the scriptures and i read of how jesus was so patient with people so loving toward his critics so gracious with sinners he was patient in teaching his disciples who over and over and over misunderstood the point that he was trying to make. And I watched how a single moment spent with him would transform the lives of those who came to see him. And as I read through the scriptures, I do this often, I think this thought, I, just, I can't help but shake my head and say, Jesus... There's so many ways that I'm not like you. Oh. Help me to be like you. And I look at the fruit of the Spirit. You know, the primary indication that you have the Holy Spirit is not that you can drive out sickness, though you should. The primary indication that the Holy Spirit dwells in you is not that you can command demons though you should. The primary indication that the Holy Spirit dwells in you is the character of Jesus so in good. you. The character of Christ described in Galatians is that fruit of the Spirit. Hmm. And whenever you come to this place where after striving and toiling and working and thinking and struggling and emotionally wrestling, you come to the end of yourself. And that's when the Holy Ghost shows up. Mm. Every time. Every time. When you come to the end of yourself and you say, Lord, there's no more strength I have to offer you. There's no more gifting that I can apply. There's no more thought process mm. that I can work through. I have nothing else. I, I'm, I've given you my all. I'm like Martha, who when you came to my house, I tried cooking for you to connect with you when all you wanted was my company. Mm. And after emptying yourself, Lord, I failed again. Like Paul the Apostle mm. wrote, the things I want to do, I just can't seem to do mm. those things. The things I don't want to do, for some reason, I can't stop. Oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to save me from this corrupt nature? The scripture says this in Romans chapter 8. The scripture declares that he will quicken your mortal bodies. What does that mean? Quicken your mortal bodies. It means that the Holy Spirit literally empowers you in your physical being to do that which you ought. Holiness comes not through attempting to keep track of all those things. That's mm -hmm. tedious, and that's religion, by the way. Mm -hmm. You see, religion is always complicated and tedious and demands that we keep that list. I love that you talked about the list because I think we all have that list. Mm -hmm. Even in prayer, when I would go to pray, I would go, okay, I know I'm supposed to pray in tongues. I know I'm supposed to do spiritual warfare. I know I'm supposed to intercede. I know I'm supposed to make my prayer requests. I know I'm supposed to pray for the nations, pray for the church, pray for my pastor, pray for my neighbor, pray for my neighbor's mm. dog. I'm supposed to pray for all these things. 
And I felt like I had this list in my head. Do I stand? Do I sit? Do I speak out loud? Do I whisper? Can I lie down in bed? Is that disrespectful? Will that bother you? All of this flurry of thoughts running through my mind. And I took my list Hmm. and I looked at it and I said, this is too much. (laughs) I looked at my list and I said, here's all the ways I'm not like you. Hmm. Too much. Too much. I, I, I seem to be getting stuck in my ways. So what I did, I took that list and I said to the Holy Spirit, you take the list mm-hmm. and I'll just follow you. It's the fulfillment of everything we are supposed to do and be found in surrender to the Holy Ghost. Mm-hmm. And that comes by way of his power. Not through anything that we can do. We can't change ourselves. I mean, who can do that other than the Holy Spirit? Yeah, there are people who can change the exterior. The power mm-hmm. of God can change the exterior, but only the presence of God can transform your heart. Mm-hmm. And so we see this character beginning to develop in us, loving, joyful, peaceful. Oh, my goodness, that peace that passes all understanding. You ever been around people? They make you really tense. Hmm just at 100 miles an hour nonstop. And I'm not talking about personality types. I'm talking about actual tension. Oh, goodness, Lord, deliver us from our tension. Hmm. Deliver us from being so wrapped up in ourselves and all that comes from striving and working. Just give it to the Holy Spirit. He's a faithful friend who can help you and guide you. You don't have to keep track of it. You just have to follow his voice. John 14, 26. Hmm. He'll remind you of the things I have said, Mm -hmm. and he'll reveal the truth. He reminds and he reveals. Just follow him. Just the other day, Pastor Vlad, and I was telling you this at lunch as well. You know, I just came out of a season where it was just go, 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 go. Now, some seasons are okay like that, but you have to learn to tether those seasons. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you go, go, go. Okay, but then follow it up by rest, 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 rest after that. Mm So I'm sitting in my living room. And I think I was just reading the word. I don't remember what I I was either just sitting there praying or I was reading the word. And I remember just this nudge from the Holy Ghost saying, take your wife on vacation. (laughs) He'll tell you things like that. Come on, somebody. And all the wives said, amen. The Holy Ghost told me, he told me, he said, take your wife on vacation. Because there's really different ways the Holy Spirit speaks. Uh Primarily through the word. That's the safest way to hear him. Mm -hmm. After the word, there's wisdom. It's that inner pool on your life. After wisdom, it's the whisper to the heart. Mm -hmm. And after the whisper to the heart, it's the wonders. It's prophecy and dreams and visions and so forth. But I I sense that nudge, that whisper. The Holy Spirit said, take your wife on vacation. And I just knew it. So I called my wife to the living room. I think she was with Aria playing with her or something. And I said, Jess... Jess? Pick a date. I want to take you on a vacation. Oh, well, she, Pastor Vlad, she started almost jumping up and down. She told me, I literally just prayed 15 wow. minutes ago. Wow. She said, Holy Spirit, not fair. I want to go on vacation, and I think Diga needs to go on vacation because there's so much pressure on him. And she said, but I, and because she's so supportive, she says, I didn't want to say that because I didn't want to put more pressure. Well, now you got to take me on vacation. She's sweet like that. Mm -hmm. She said, so I just said, Lord, you tell him. And 15 minutes later, the Holy Ghost spoke. And that's why it's so important we yield to that voice because he will shape the character. That's so important as wives not to try to, um, you know, not to become the Holy Spirit to the husbands but to develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit, you know, so then, and the husband to have a good relationship with the Holy, the Holy Spirit is for your marriage. He's for your happiness, okay? But, of course, he's first for our holiness, and so I, I'm with you. I have had not once or not twice <laughs> after prayer, after a time of prayer, and I, I go usually away from the house to pray, and I will be driving, and I just feel this prompting, 
pull over uh, to this particular place and get some flowers. Trust me, I didn't even think about it. <laughs> and uh, and I would bring those flowers and man, that would get me so many brownie points. And I was like, Holy Spirit, that's your fruit. You get the credit for this because I wasn't thinking about it, unfortunately. I like to say that the grace of God is the glue that holds together all the shattered and broken pieces of who I am. Come on. And that glue, if it were not for that glue, hey. I'd be. if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, I'd be a thousand pieces on the floor. Believe wow. me. I saw in the comments, somebody said, David, you need to hang out with my husband more often. <laughs> but but listen to this. Listen to this. My, my wife just texted me this. She said, Aria is watching you live. That's my daughter. And she just kissed the phone. She's watching me live on the phone. She kissed the phone twice and said, I love you, Dada. Oh. Aria, I love you too. Mm. So anyway, so we're talking about how to know you have the Holy Spirit. And I, I just sense such a strong flow here. I want to leave it here just for a little while longer. You know, we talk about the fact that confidence in salvation is a sign you have the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Godly character is probably the primary sign you have the Holy Spirit. But another sign that you have the Holy Spirit, maybe not the primary sign or the for sure sign, considering Matthew chapter 7, verse 23, is power. You mm -hmm. talked about the inner power, 1 John 2, 27, mm -hmm. that inner witness versus Acts 1, 8, the power upon. Mm -hmm. So talk to us, Pastor Vlad, the sign of power on a life when the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Yeah, so um, the, the power of the Holy Spirit, there's that, I call it the inward anointing and the, the outer anointing and the inner anointing. The inner anointing is what builds the, the character, the attitudes. Because if we look at the fruit of the Spirit, they're mainly attitudes. They're not actions. It's not, you will not steal, you will not lie, you will not murder. It deals with attitudes. And then the, the power of the Holy Spirit that flows out of us is, is the outer anointing, is what gives us the power to serve the purpose. Because our purpose is powered by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're not if we're not powered by the Holy Spirit, if we're not empowered by the Holy Spirit, what will begin to happen is we will do, we will flow with our natural abilities mm. instead of overflowing with God's supernatural anointing. Ministry was never meant to be a career. It's always meant to be a calling. You can accomplish your career with a degree. You cannot accomplish a calling with a degree. Degrees are good, but anointing is the prerequisite. It's the requirement for ministry. We see that about Jesus when he came out of the season of wilderness. He came, the Bible says, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we see ministry started. He preached in the power of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people, David, they think that we only need the power of the Holy Spirit to do miracles, mm -hmm. but Jesus relied on the power of the Holy Spirit to do ministry, wow. basic ministry, helping the poor, guiding the traffic on the parking lot, uh, holding a camera in the church. Anything that is done for the kingdom of God is done for the purpose of salvation of eternal souls. It's done in conflict with the kingdom plot and the devices and schemes of the enemy. This is not a social work that we're doing. We're not handing out sandwiches, making people's lives better. We are affecting someone's eternity. We are plundering hell and populating heaven. Therefore, from simple things, posting online, to children's ministry, through ushering, lights, video, making coffee in the ministry, everything we have to depend in all of that on the power of the Holy Spirit, on the strength of the Holy Spirit, on the insight of the Holy Spirit. Depending on the Holy Spirit, it does not mean that everything you do, you always walk around speaking in tongues. It means that consciously you are leaning and saying, Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, empower me. Holy Spirit, give me, add your super to my natural. Holy Spirit, empower my speech. Otherwise, I become a motivational speaker that provides inspiration instead of the preacher of the gospel that brings forth transformation in Beautiful. someone's lives. Otherwise, I rely on my natural abilities. They're not wrong, but in the realm of the kingdom, in what God called us to do, we have to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. And so one of the signs of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and I like to say like this, is that, you know, He fills me for me but he overflows 
for others. If I take a cup, for example, right now, and, and I bring another cup of water, okay, and I start pouring, and I won't demonstrate it because I'm going to spill it over me, and I usually do that illustration to spill it on other people, but nobody's around me right now. <laughs> and so when you take the water and you begin to pour water into this cup, once this cup gets filled, there's so much this cup can take. The rest of the water that begins to flow into this cup begins to come out of this, of this bottle into everything around this bottle. It's going to touch the desk. It will touch the computer. So the Holy Spirit fills you for you. But there's so much of Him that He begins to fill you to the overflow. The overflow is for others. Therefore, I'm one of those big component, I'm big pioneers, and not pioneers, but a spokesman that ministry should be an overflow of Spirit's life inside of us. We shouldn't be running on empty with the Holy Spirit because not only it's creating a deficit in our own character, it's creating a huge problem in our ministries because a lot of times the appointing, the title, the ministry continues, somebody loses that feeling, loses that walking, that intimacy with the Holy Spirit and they start grinding. There is no grace no more. There is no rhythm to God's favor in their life no more. It's just grinding. It's just grinding. It's like Saul without that anointing. They start having mental attacks, mental disorders and demonic attacks and killing priests left and right, jealousy and all of that craziness. He has no power to stand against Goliath even though he is taller than anybody else. He has the experience. He has the title. He has the military training. He has, the, he has everything. He does, has one thing that's lacking. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. He's lacking the anointing. And therefore, while he can still do the technical things of ministry, he can still do some of the administrational parts of ministry. He can't actually do the ministry because you can't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. The presence of the Holy Spirit, when it's no longer entertained, if I could use that word, no longer hosted, sooner or later his power will no longer flow and therefore the presence brings that power it releases that power and so for us we don't chase the power we desire it we pray for it we seek the impartation we learn to operate in it but as we treasure as we host the holy ghost we begin to see the overflow of his presence it spills into other people it flows out in gifts in signs and in wonders. The key to the power of the Holy Spirit is the presence of the Holy Spirit. Mm. The more time you spend in the presence of the Holy Spirit, the more intense the power of God will be upon your life. Now, some would say the Bible says in Psalm chapter 139, where can I escape from your spirit? So aren't I spending time in the presence of the Holy Spirit 24-7? whether I'm aware of it or not. And that's true to a degree. But what I'm talking about is this awareness of his so presence good. near you. When you begin to surrender your life to the presence of the Holy Spirit in that way, in that you're aware of the surroundings, mm. that produces a power on your life that really so can't be duplicated. Remember, the Holy Spirit will always back his word with power. But the Holy Spirit will only back his people with his presence. Only his people can have his presence to where it's that tangible touch to where you're carrying an atmosphere with you wherever you go. Now, as it goes with the power of the Holy Spirit, it's possible to live in the presence of the Holy Spirit in that awareness, receive a touch of his power. This is terrifying. This is terrifying. It's possible to live in that awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit receive a touch of his power and then walk away from that awareness. Mm. And then that power that was supposed to bless your life begins to produce chaos because there's no grounding for the power. Just like I have a cable here in my laptop, the electricity is running into the laptop because it's grounded, it's directed. So when I live in the presence of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit is directed and it's grounded. Think about the fact that the tormenting spirit on Saul came not from the devil, it came from God. Mm -hmm. That's what the Bible says. God sent him a tormenting spirit. What is that? Mm -hmm. That's what happens when you walk in the power, 
without living in the presence. You begin to have so this good. charismatic witchcraft lifestyle where you're taking the miracles, but not preaching the message. Where you're demonstrating the power, but you're not walking with the person who is Christ. You know the gifts, you don't mm -hmm. know the glory. And what begins to happen is your, your, your anointing becomes polluted. That which you carry begins to be infected by things in the world, worldly mentalities, mm. by your emotions, by things that are not necessarily demonic, but secular in nature. And whereas you began with the power of the Holy Spirit, it's possible that you begin to lean on your power and then now you have to try to sustain it. The reason sometimes people are so exhausted and so burned out and so tired of ministry and serving God is because they're giving from the wrong source. They're giving from themselves instead of tapping deeper into the well and pulling out from the spirit who is that living water. As Pastor Vlad said, all ministry, all true ministry is an overflow of your walk with the Holy Spirit. And if there is no overflow, then it's not ministry, it's charity. It's not preaching, it's motivational speaking. It's not gathering, it's a country club. That's what happens when mm. you begin to try to do things in your own strength. Mm. Now, that power that comes on your life begins to bring healing to the sick. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Mm -hmm. And he began doing good. And I thought that was interesting. I'll touch on that in a moment. He began doing good, healing all who were sick and oppressed mm -hmm. by the devil. Now think about this. Yes, we understand that the power of the Holy Spirit enables you to drive out sickness and demons. That's accepted. We all know that. But I thought it was rather odd that in the midst of these supernatural demonstrations, we see that Jesus was empowered to simply do good. Mm -hmm. And I'm reminded so of the people who worked on the artifacts in the tabernacle, mm -hmm. who worked on the ark, who worked on the lampstand, who worked mm. on the utensils that were used for service in that place. And the Bible says that these men were filled with the Holy Spirit as craftsmen. In other words, the Holy Spirit doesn't just empower you mm -hmm. to do what we deem as supernatural. Mm -hmm. He empowers you in the everyday and the practical. The seemingly mundane moments of your life can be spirit filled mm -hmm. in that God can empower you to be a good husband. God can empower you to be a good wife. God can empower you to be a good parent, to be a good sibling, to be a good friend, to be a good student, to be a good worker, to be a good business owner. The Holy Spirit is involved with us, and that power is demonstrated in both the supernatural and the natural. And so we begin to walk in that. Now, this is a perfect segue into the next topic that we want to cover. And of course, we won't be able to delve into everything. I mean, there's, we could sit here talking for hours and hours and hours and hours, and we would never run out of things to say about the Holy Spirit. Mm. But I want to transition now. Let's talk, Pastor Vlad, about how to walk in that power. I'll add this, and then I'd love to get your thoughts. How to walk in that power. I'll say this. You have to learn to protect the anointing on your life. This mm. is one of the most powerful things that I've ever learned from one of my spiritual mentors, who is someone I consider my spiritual father. He taught me the importance of and then how to protect the anointing on my life. Mm. Really, God will produce the anointing through you. Now, salvation is free, but the anointing will cost you everything. You have to die to self. Paul said, I die daily. Mm -hmm. Some of us probably need to die more than daily, maybe every hour on the hour. And so this power is produced. God processes that and gives us this power that we carry upon our lives. But whereas God produces that power, we must protect it. Mm -hmm. I remember I was ministering in Chicago, Illinois. We were getting ready for a miracle service that we were doing out there. We rented a local church and we were just holding a meeting out there. And boy, was it exciting. We were thrilled to be there in that part of the United States. We had been wanting to get out there for some time. We worked on logistics. So I get there. And Pastor Vlad, maybe you've had moments like this. I'm, I'm in my hotel room. I'm ironing my shirt, just getting ready. I think I was working on the collar for the, the button up. I'm ironing it. And suddenly I sense in the room just this heavy anointing. Like I felt like if I moved my hand, I would feel almost like it was wading through water. Not that mm. dense, but like definitely the atmosphere had shifted. Now, 
We carry the presence of the Holy Spirit within us at all times, but I'm talking about the tangible touch of the Holy Spirit's power because there is a tangible element mm -hmm. to the anointing. And so I'm moving my hand around and I, I could sense like the, the, the degree of the denseness had intensified and I really did feel like either there was a mist or there was some type of liquid in the air. I can't explain it. And so I sense in the room that I'm walking in, I just felt real like, like floaty, like they say. I, that's when I felt it. And I'm moving through it. I'm going, oh my goodness, this is, this is intense. And it wasn't just a physical manifestation. I didn't just sense it on my body. I knew in my spirit that God was in that room in a tangible way with me because I sensed the sweetness. And some of mm. you know what I'm talking about. When you get into that presence, there's just a real sweetness. The Holy mm -hmm. Spirit's presence is regal. It's divine. It's classy. It's elegant. It's not tense and worked up. It's just a beautiful heavenly flow. And so mm. I remember I'm in the room and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, he's here. He's in the room with me. And so it was just a very sweet presence. I sensed, you talk about peace. I, the, the, the building could have been collapsing. I would have been perfectly fine. The, there was such peace. There was such joy. Mm. I was just like bubbling over with the, almost euphoria. I was just like, mm. whoa, this is just beautiful. The presence of the Holy Spirit. I can sense it even talking about it. Mm. And so I'm getting ready to go downstairs and meet my team in the hotel lobby. We were gathering to take an Uber there to the service. And so I get downstairs and it's me and then Steve, I know you're watching right now. You were there with me and there was a few other guys on the ministry team. I get down to the lobby and suddenly I sense this beautiful heaviness on me start to dissipate. Now, it wasn't that the Holy Spirit was leaving me. You talk, Pastor Vlad, very beautifully about the inner anointing and the outer anointing. And that's what happens. The inner anointing never goes, but that outer anointing, the manifestation, it intensifies and then it begins to dissipate if we're not giving it the proper hosting that it deserves. And so in that moment, I began to sense this heavy, beautiful, heavenly weight on my body start to dissipate. And I thought, no, 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 no. I, 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 I want to take this to the service with me. And so mm. I told Steve, I said, Steve, I'm going to put my headphones on. You talk to the guys. And even as my team was talking, they weren't saying anything ungodly or demonic. They were literally talking about where mm. they ate and what they went and had done during the day. But as I was listening to them talking, I felt this weight dissipating. And I said, I can't hear that conversation. They're not saying anything ungodly. Mm. They're not saying anything demonic, but I can't hear that conversation. So I told Steve, I'm going to put my headphones on. You talk to the Uber driver. I, I got to protect whatever this is I'm in. So I put my headphones on and then I start pacing in the lobby while we're waiting for the car to get there. I look at the television screen and there was a program that wasn't in any means offensive. It was something that I would feel comfortable having on the television screen where my daughter present. There was nothing inherently wrong about what was being broadcast. But even as I looked at that screen, I sensed the intensification begin to diminish. So I diverted my eyes. Like I, I, I bounced my eyes right off that screen and we get in the car the whole time. I'm looking at the back seat or the, the front seat. I'm in the back. I'm looking at the, the, the headrest in front of me. And I don't even want to look out the window because here's what was happening. When I would look out my window and I would see a billboard or an advertisement or even just signs for restaurants mm -hmm. that would weaken. And I thought, Lord, it's as if the mundane, it's as if the mundane itself is an insult to your glory. Oh. I get there. There's a line of people outside. So I have to run past everyone because I'm like, I can't stop for, I can't stop to pray for anyone right now. I can't stop to talk to anyone. I don't know what's going to disrupt this. I said, I got to go right to the office. I went to the office. People must have thought I was crazy because I had the ushers put up these curtains on the window to block anybody looking in and me looking out. I just didn't want any distractions. And I carried this. It was as if, Pastor Vlad, I was carrying this little ember. Mm. And I carried it to the service. As soon as I stepped on the platform, Whatever that ember was, it was it, it rushed through the room and the whole room was set ablaze with the power of the Holy Ghost. And so I say that yeah. story to illustrate that we have to protect the anointing, not just from the demonic, mm -hmm. not just from sin, but from the secular, mm. but from ordinary distractions. Ordinary mm. everyday things aren't evil and they're not wrong. The problem with ordinary everyday things is that often they are instead of divine things. And so there's 
really much to be said of protecting that anointing on your life and guarding it with everything that you have. So good, so good, David. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. <laughs> I'm over here receiving. If you guys are receiving, uh, drop that fire emoji um, in the chat. This, this is so powerful about protecting the anointing that God has given to us. Um, you know, I think that the anointing, the Bible says, it's already in us when we have the Holy Spirit's baptism. But through our association, I like to say that in three ways that it can get activated. It's through the impartation, somebody praying for us, and we see that in the Bible and there's many scriptures that through impartation, spiritual gifts and power can be transferred. We know that you cannot transfer intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Mm. You can transfer um, your connection to the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit through impartation, but you can transfer the gifts and the power and then through your associations. You know, the Bible says that King Saul went among the prophets and he prophesied. Um, and so as you surround yourself with people who walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, it w anointing is transferable. You can catch it. Um, and then anointing also gets activated through our desperation. I think regardless of how you activate it, in order to keep it, you have to stay hungry. You have wow. to stay hungry for the person of the Holy Spirit and you have to honor the Holy Spirit and His ways. On, on my end, a few things I want to share about how the anointing I've seen many times operates in my life. And I want to add like the other side of it where anointing of the Holy Spirit, the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit can flow. It mainly flows through our identity, our understanding of who we are in Jesus. Because there are moments, and I know David, you probably have experienced this many times when we might not feel anything. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, we rely on who we are in Christ. And sometimes even, you know, maybe we've had a little um, outburst of anger or lost our temper on the way to the meeting or, our, you know, woke up from the wrong uh, side of the bed or, or just, I mean, things happen. We're involved with so many things uh, administrationally in our ministries and stuff. And when I was younger, it used to throw me off so much when it came to the point of actually ministering in the power of the Holy Spirit, whether it's praying for the sick, giving a call for salvation, or ministering deliverance, and there were these condemning thoughts that would come in and say that, that's it, you shouldn't even allow the Spirit of God to use you today because you're disqualified from that. And there's a story in the Old Testament that changed my perspective on this, is when the first healing that took place in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that we see it recorded. I'm pretty sure the healings probably happened before that. But the first healing where God revealed Himself as, you know, God, uh, no, God reveals Himself as God who heals later in Exodus. But when God came to Abimelech and told Abimelech to invite Abraham, the prophet, to pray for all the women in his courts who were barren. But the interesting part is that in the context of that story, Abraham lied about wow. his wife. And God comes to Abimelech, instead of apologizing to Abimelech for his sloppy, pathetic prophet, that's what I would have been doing. I, was, I, I would say to Abimelech, I'm really sorry. Abraham is working on his honesty. <laughs> He's, you know, we signed him up with a few courses. He's not doing well. He had good months, but this time he really blew it. It's a generational thing. His father had it. His children have it kind of a thing. But it, God doesn't apologize. He said, this man is my prophet. How could God call Abraham prophet when he got caught in a lie? Because God referred to his identity at that moment. That does not in any way endorse flaws or makes them justifiable. But it does tell us how God sees us in spite of our issues. We all have issues. We all have things that we are dealing with, working through. And then Abraham has to pray for the women, for the issue his own wife does not have breakthrough in. And so, and I find these two secrets that helped me to be used by the Holy Spirit in the way that I would say, I would credit to this revelation not to rely on my issues but on my identity 
not on my character. When I minister, my character at that moment goes out of the window. I don't rely on my character because the Holy Spirit doesn't use my character. He uses my identity in Christ. Otherwise, Paul would not tell Corinthians who were carnal that you lack in no gift. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't say they cast out demons, heal the sick and prophesy did all of this stuff in my name. That tells me anointing can flow in spite of your character. This does not mean we should ignore our character. As David highlighted, we should allow the Spirit of God to develop the fruit. Otherwise, that anointing will take us high and lack of character will bring us down. But this gives us the freedom as ministers, as people who want to be used by the Holy Spirit, that if you are aware of a character flaw, and trust me, the devil will magnify that flaw in that moment that you're about to be used by the Holy Spirit. And he will say, look at this, look at that. You didn't read the Bible there. You, you, you didn't pray long enough. You finished your fast one day short. Look, you spoke to your wife out of order. He will always highlight that to cause you to feel like you're not good enough. God will not use you. And so throw that out and realize God is using you because of the an, an identity, anointing operates through identity. And then if he can't use that, he will use an area of your life where you're currently believing for a breakthrough. And he will say, look, you shouldn't be praying with boldness. Why? Because this area of your life doesn't have a breakthrough. You should be reserved, calculated, and cautious. You can't be courageous. You shouldn't be bold. You should be balanced. Why? Because look, in this area, you're not seeing a breakthrough. But that's not what Abraham did. Abraham went and prayed for those women and they, God healed them. And only later on, his wife received that breakthrough. So God's anointing will operate through your identity. God's anointing will operate as you anchor yourself in God's promise and His love for people instead of how much breakthrough personally you received in your life and I believe God's anointing will increase as we honor that anointing in someone else's life as you honor the anointing in someone God increases that in your life if you criticize the anointing you don't understand anointing you dislike anointing where they move in the preference that doesn't fit your personality and you always have you know an opinion you begin to attack anointing when you attack anointing you will never attract anointing if you attack Say that again healings if you attack being slain in the spirit if you attack deliverance if you attack prophecy you will not attract these things if you attack big churches your church will never grow if you attack preachers who are prosperous always thinking they're robbing everybody now there are preachers who are prosperous who are thieves Judas was a thief okay it doesn't mean every disciple was but the moment you attack something you stop attracting that in your life and so one of the things what did Abimelech do Abimelech honored the anointing on Abraham's life God told Abimelech one thing he says return the wife God never told Abimelech to give Abraham money or livestock. Never told him that. He told him, give him his wife back, otherwise you're dead. Abimelech got up. Abimelech rebuked Abraham because he was betrayed. And Abimelech returned his wife. And the Bible says he blessed him financially. He did not need to do that. Where did Abimelech got that? See, there's this principle. When you honor the anointing in someone else, that's why I believe Abimelech got the miracle before Abraham did. Because God released that grace in Abimelech's life. He had the integrity of heart. He had innocence of hands. And he had the honor. And so I'm a huge component of honoring. I honor my pastor financially every single month. I honor my pastor verbally. I honor other men of God. I honor David. I honor other men of God whom and not all of them I agree with. Not all of them we see eye to eye on everything. Please understand. Honor speaks more about you than the person you're honoring. It speaks about the quality of your character versus the person you're honoring. If you're constantly criticizing something, you are not going to be operating in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You will grieve the Holy Spirit. In fact, you can get to the point where you can actually blaspheme the Holy Spirit by constantly criticizing what you don't understand. So to operate in the anointing, uh, in my end, to summarize, rely on your identity in Christ in that moment rely on the promise of God and his love for people and then live a life that honors the anointing instead of 
criticizes the anointing. I love it. And, and I want to stress that. You attack the anointing, you will not attract the anointing. That is such a key thing that you just said. And I love that you quoted, uh, I believe that was Basilia Schlink too. Be careful of criticizing what you don't understand. Mm. And you know, honor doesn't even require that everyone agree, but you still honor. And that is what produces the power of the Holy Ghost in your life. Think about the fact that Jesus would go to his hometown. And because they didn't honor him, he was only able to do a few miracles there. So you attack the anointing, you will not attract the anointing. This is why you have to keep yourself clean. So good. Pure. Stay out of nonsense. Stay out of drama. Stay out of gossip and slander. Just preach what you know is truth. Declare the gospel. Minister healing. Minister the power of the Holy Ghost. Stay focused. And honor the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And there's something else she pointed out too that I really liked in regards to Abraham. And the fact that he had to pray for another to receive mm -hmm. that which he had not yet received himself. I thought that was a problem. You know, I've never noticed that when reading and, that portion and, and of scripture. You know, and he's, he's not the only one. If you remember, same thing happened with Joseph. That's right. He translated the dreams in the, in the prison. His own dream was on delay. Job had to pray for his friends when he was sick. The slave girl told uh, her master, her captor, about the healing evangelist, Naaman, the yeah. prophet. While he she could have easily said, look what God did to me. He allowed me to be a captive. I'm not going to tell him nothing. Jesus ministered on the cross. He healed while he was being arrested. He led another person to salvation right beside him who was suffering. So we constantly, you know, see this ministry while you're still going through certain things. And so I just always encourage people that your misery, your suffering is not an excuse. Your pain is not an excuse for your purpose. Your suffering is not an excuse for your serving. Now, I'm not in any way indicating that if you lost a loved one, that you know that you have to go back and start ministering the same way. You, you shouldn't take a break and grieve and process. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about people who always have an excuse. I can't serve. Why? It's been 20 years and I'm still, I'm still get, wow. just getting over that. I think it's just a bunch of baloney. So there's something that I want to say that I think someone watching right now needs to hear. And it's right along the vein of when you were talking about the fact that some people feel disqualified from being used by God because mm -hmm. of something that they're struggling with. I'm going to touch on that in a moment. But first, I want to stop and acknowledge that we've topped over 1,500 concurrent viewers now. Now, we've only been doing this stream for eight weeks, and we are seeing very fast growth with our streaming numbers. So that's to your credit, Spirit Family. You are an amazing community of believers, and I so love gathering with you online. So I'm going to say what I'm going to say in a moment, but first, make sure you're subscribed to Encounter TV and click that notification bell when you do subscribe so you can receive notices when we put out new content. Leave a like on the video. And now I want to say what I think needs to be said. Isaiah chapter 6 Isaiah has this powerful encounter with God. He sees the heavenly realm open. Visions displayed of angelic being crying holy as they fly about the temple. The train of God's robe appears in front of him. And the voices of the angels shake the temple to its foundations. He is seeing a heavenly display of the beauty and glory of Almighty God. And there in the midst of that encounter looking and seeing God as he's revealed himself. Isaiah doesn't say how holy you are. Mm. Isaiah doesn't say what magnificent creatures flying about. Isaiah doesn't say there's the hem of your garment, there's the fringe of your robe, there's the train of your robe. Let me touch that train of your robe and receive power. No, 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 no. Mm. What does Isaiah do? I love the way the King James Version puts it. He says, woe is me for I am undone. For, my, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine mm. eyes have seen the King, the glory of God. Mm. There in the midst of seeing God, there capturing this heavenly glimpse, Isaiah looks at himself. Why? Think about Moses, did the same thing. Exodus chapter 3, God calls him, a burning bush before him, the voice speaking to him talking of slavery and talking 
of those bound under Egyptian oppression, the cries of God's people having reached the heavenly realm. And all Moses can say is, you got the wrong guy. Hmm. We have the tendency to do this. Isaiah disqualified himself, but think about the fact that Isaiah says, what is filthy about him? He says, woe is me, for I am undone. And then what does he say makes him undone? I am a man of unclean lips. And the very thing that Isaiah thought disqualified him, Mm. God cleansed and used. So good. What does the angel do? You notice God doesn't even respond to Isaiah's reaction. God doesn't even acknowledge that he's wallowing in the misery of his own Mm. human nature. What does God do? Nothing. The angel, knowing God's God's nature, just says, I'm going to grab one of these tongs from the altar. I'm going to take a coal and touch your lips with it so your guilt is gone. Your guilt is removed. In other words, God cleanses what you think disqualifies you. And not only does he cleanse what you think disqualifies you, he uses it. Mm. He uses it for his glory. And Isaiah... A man of unclean lips becomes a mouthpiece of heaven. You see, when the glory of God shows up in your life and the power of the Holy Spirit begins to move through you, Mm. you're going to be tempted to look at your flaws and rightfully so because the closer the light of God comes to Mm. you, the more apparent and visible and details all those misgivings Mm -hmm. and inappropriate character flaws become clearer. Mm -hmm. the closer I get to God, the more I recognize in me that is undone. Mm. I'm going to say that again. The closer I get to God, Mm. the more I recognize in me that is undone. I begin to see this is undone in me. Mm. I need this fixed. I need you to do something about Mm. this, God. But as long as we acknowledge what is wrong with us and we let God cleanse us, Mm. That becomes a tool, not a barrier. And so you may feel like you're getting worse and worse. Could it be that maybe you're not getting worse and worse, but your standards are getting higher and higher? Could it be that maybe you're not becoming more sinful? You're simply becoming more aware of sin. You're becoming more sensitive to it. Whereas back in the day, you could have said this. You could have done that. You could have watched that. You could have listened to that. And now suddenly there's something in your spirit that says, I just can't touch that. I can't watch that. I can't listen to that. You're becoming more and more sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And you're becoming sensitive to the things that remind the Holy Spirit of what breaks his heart. Mm. And now God begins to mold you. Mm. God begins to shape you. God begins to take that which you thought disqualified you and he cleanses it and then he uses you. Mm. And Jesus really modeled for us how to walk in this power. You see, we, we, we walk in the power by protecting the anointing. We walk in the power by living holy. We walk in the power by recognizing that God uses imperfect people. The qualification for your ministry is the Holy Spirit's work in you. Now, looking to Jesus as our example, think of the fact that the Word became flesh. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, Mm. And the word was with God and the word, word was God. Mm. John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory full of grace and truth. God the Father, God incomprehensible, God who no one can understand really in the natural mind, became flesh. Think about this. It's easier for me to explain the intricacies and the inner workings of my cell phone to an insect than it is for me to explain if I was even capable of doing so. The mind of God to man. We don't understand him. If the creator, God, opened an impossible door and that creator stepped into his own creation, Mm. becoming flesh, the miracle of the incarnation. And the scripture tells us in Philippians that Jesus 
didn't equate himself or he didn't take on those divine privileges. Now, let me say this just to make it perfectly clear so that nobody misunderstands what I'm saying, especially in the day of YouTube. As often happens with me, people will take 30 seconds or five seconds or a minute. And Pastor Vlad, I'm sure it happens with you all the time. Mm -hmm. And they'll do they'll build a whole theory on what you, they think you teach based on that. And so let me just be very clear. Jesus is God. Jesus has always been God. Mm -hmm. Jesus has always been aware that he's God. There's never been a moment where he had to realize, oh, I'm God. It, was, it didn't work that way. Jesus was, is, mm -hmm. always will be God. There was never so a moment good. where Jesus wasn't God. But check this so out. Good. Check this out. Luke 2.52. And Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God, in favor with man. I always found that puzzling. I get that Jesus grew in stature. He had a physical body. But Jesus, the son of God, grew in wisdom. Hmm. I get that he grew in favor with man because not everyone likes anyone. I mean, hmm. everyone has someone who dislikes them, including the Lord. There are people who hate God. So mm -hmm. I could see how Jesus could grow in favor with man. But the fact that Jesus grew in favor with God, hmm. whoa. Think of the fact that Adam never had to grow. Adam never had to learn. Adam never had to experience even birth. He didn't have to grow in wisdom. He came programmed from the hand of God. That's why he makes a terrible savior. He's not very relatable. But Jesus mm. came. He grew. He grew. Mm. Jesus was always God. Can you kill God? No, yet Jesus died. Think about the fact that God is omnipresent, yet Jesus traveled. If you can travel by definition, you're not omnipresent at that moment. So Jesus limited certain divine qualities, always being God. He allowed himself to experience human limitations. And mind you, at any moment, he could have pulled himself out of those limitations. Easy. But he chose to humble himself and to experience these limitations. Yet the work of the Holy Spirit was so perfect in him. Luke 135 tells us that it was by the Holy Spirit that Jesus was conceived. And that work was so perfect that the scripture declares, for in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything, not a thing missing. So therefore, Jesus was truly God, truly man. Yet Jesus did not rely on his own power. Jesus relied on the power of the Holy Ghost. Think about the fact that God the Father trusted the Holy Spirit with his Son. Think about that. Mm -hmm. And then the Son trusted the Holy Spirit with his disciples. Mm. And now the Holy Spirit is entrusted to the church. Mm. The Holy Spirit working with us from the beginning. Mm. The Holy Spirit demonstrating his power. The Holy Spirit rested on Jesus. We saw that in Matthew 3, 16, mm. where the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus. Think mm. about the fact that Jesus cast out demons by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Matthew 12, 28. But if I am casting out demons by the Spirit of God, mm -hmm. then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. Jesus healed the sick by the power of the Holy Spirit. I quoted Acts 10, 38 earlier. Mm -hmm. Jesus preached by the power of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 61.1. Do you realize this is going to, this is going to shake you up. Listen to this. This shook me to my core. Jesus was even resurrected by the power of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Th th this, this, think about this. Romans 8.11. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Now, we always quote and say, well, the Holy Spirit lives in me. And that's what the scripture is saying. Yes, but think about what the scripture is saying there in passing. The Holy Spirit who what? Who raised Jesus from the dead? Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here we see Jesus coming to earth, the word becoming incarnate, stripping himself by his own will of certain divine abilities. And then entrusting himself to the Holy Spirit's power to raise him. Now check this out. 
for all of eternity, if I can even word it that way because you run into paradoxes when you try to describe eternity in terms of time. But the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all existed together as one, a continual state mm. of unity. Mm. Never had that trinity been broken from fellowship. Mm. Yet, on that cross, Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, we, of course, know this is Jesus prophesying a psalm or, or, or quoting a psalm to demonstrate that he was the fulfillment of the prophecy, the one where it says, I, they've pierced my hands and my feet and so forth. So in one sense, that's what he was saying. But still, it holds true the words he was speaking that God did forsake him. God rejected him in that moment. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The Holy Ghost left him. And Jesus, who had never before known the tearing of that fellowship, allows himself to be disconnected from that power. Oh, my goodness. Wow. And takes a trust fall. <coughs> he takes a trust fall mm -hmm. backwards mm. into the grave. And he trusted that the Holy Spirit would catch him. Mm. Whoa. So good. If Jesus so good. trusted the Holy Spirit for power, surely we can trust the Holy Spirit for power. Pastor Vlad. So good. No, wow. You know, I want to add uh, something to that. In Hebrews 9, 14 and 15, it says, How much more shall the blood of Jesus, blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit mm -hmm. offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your consciousness from dead works to serve the living God? It's interesting because all of that, Jesus was born by the Spirit, as, as David mentioned. Jesus, you know, was filled by the Spirit. He was led by the Holy Spirit. In the wilderness, he also was, if I could say, supported by the Holy Spirit by relying on the Holy Scriptures. And I have a whole chapter in my um, short book, Spirit Filled Jesus, where I deal with how the Spirit of God in your wilderness time, he hides in the Holy Scriptures. Because as you see, Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit to the wilderness, but then in the wilderness, you don't see the mention of the Holy Spirit. You see the quoting of the Holy Scriptures because the Holy Spirit, he is in this word. You can, you begin to speak that word and it, it helps you to get through it. That's why in Ephesians it says, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, mm -hmm. meaning he's connected to his word. And then, you know, Jesus heals through the Holy Spirit. He casts the demons out. He preaches by the power of the Holy Spirit. He depends on that. And the Bible says that Jesus offered himself up through the Spirit you know, as a sacrifice. And the Holy Spirit was involved in that very Gethsemane path, that, that act of surrender. He was there. And then, you know, we see as David explained so beautifully and profoundly how Jesus gave up the Spirit and Spirit raised him from the dead. You know, I, I like to encourage people that if the Spirit will lead you to the cross, He will always meet you at the resurrection. Wow. You know, not always the Holy Spirit leads us to things that we want to see happen. He led Jesus to fast. He led Jesus to die. But then he was on the other side, raising him. You know, Jesus was not the only one who died on the cross. Let's face it. There was two other guys that were going through the same pain. They were not the same spiritual pain because they were not carrying the weight of sin but they were going through the same physical suffering that Jesus was going through. Jesus' suffering of course was different because he was holy, he was righteous and he carried our sin but none of those guys got raised from the dead afterwards. None of those guys the Holy Spirit raised up because the Holy Spirit didn't lead them there. Who led them there was their sin. And one of them, of course, got saved. But Jesus went through that, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to encourage you to be obedient to the Holy Spirit when He leads you through difficult times. I've experienced that when, you know, when I started to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. In my fellowship with the Holy Spirit, He started to speak to me. He started to give me these promptings. And these promptings were not the ones I wanted to hear. 
at first. They had to do with things that were idols in my life. They had to do with things that I was so closely attached to. They had to do with finances. For as long as I could remember in my Christian walk, I was extremely frugal person and I was not very generous person. And God wanted to detach that materialism out. And I remember, and as I started to develop this fellowship with the Holy Spirit, He started to speak to me. And one of the first things that He spoke, we came from our trip from the Ukraine. I borrowed my car to my cousin who did not have a car. We had two cars, me and my wife. And I came back, I think very late. I had a jet lag, so I couldn't sleep at night. Decided to take my car that I had and go to the bank to get some money for tithing. And um, as I'm driving through, I see my, the driver where my cousin lives and I see my car there. And I hear this still small voice, give this car away. <laughs> And I was like, man, this is not good. I'm hearing voices and it's a jet lag. So I'm, of course, I'm ignoring it. I'm, I'm, I'm blaming it, the jet lag. I was like, it's just, you know, my mind, my emotions are not balanced right now. I get the tithing money. So I'm a smart guy. I'm like, I'm not going to be driving through that street again. I'm going to take a different street. I don't want to see my car and I don't want to hear voices. So I got into my house. I can't sleep. And I hear this thing. It just doesn't leave me. And uh, I get the point. I think it's the Holy Spirit talking. So I was like, if I suggested to my wife that we will give a car away and she jumps at that opportunity, says, let's do it, then it's from God. If not, and in my mind, I'm like, she's not going to agree because we only have one car. We have both jobs. It's just going to complicate our lives. And I was like, God would not ask us something like that to complicate our lives. I mean, God is a God of war and not a God of complications. So I'm throwing all these scriptures at it to silence it. But you know, when you know that you know that you know that you know that it's God, scripture won't work. Okay, you can't, even Satan tried to throw scripture at Jesus. It didn't work. And so just, you can't do that. So I asked my wife and she just says, you know what, let's do it. I was like, you got to be kidding me. I'm like, God, she slept and you just got to her before me. And so, and we, and that was our first vehicle that we gave away. And as of today, I think we gave about six away. And it was all like that, being led by the Holy Spirit. And he led me to those moments. It made my life complicated. But then he met me on the other side where he started to bring that resurrection. And so I just wanted to encourage you on a practical level. If the Spirit leads you, he will give you the strength and he will meet you on the, on, the other, on the other side. You know, David, it was actually at the Holy Spirit conference in January in, here in California. It was a sixth day. Uh, for me, we did a, a prolonged fast with I our team. I remember that you were drinking coconut water when you were with us. Yes. And so I was uh, evening service with Pastor Benny. Uh, beautiful atmosphere of presence of God. And... I made up my mind, you know, we will do a 21 day, uh, you know, water or a liquid fast. And right, right there and then, as I got on my knees, the scripture popped in my mind that Jesus fasted 40 days and then he returned in power. And I hear this still small voice, but very strong. You have to go for 40 day fast. Wow. And I was like, no, I, have not, I haven't finished 21 yet. I'm like, 40 days, no. And I'm just arguing. But you know, when you're in the presence of God, His voice becomes more clear. So like for me, it was very clear. He was speaking. I said, Lord, I won't make it. I'm going to die. And I was like, is that what you want? You know, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking, Jesus, you know, so I ain't, ain't going to make it. And I felt like the Holy Spirit's like, Vlad, you have a lot of reserves. <laughs> you're going to make it. I got up from, the, from, the, from my knees. I grabbed my wife's hand. And I said, babe, I'm going to go for 40. The Spirit of God will give me strength. And I'm going to tell you one thing. I traveled in the midst of those 40-day fast on liquids to Ukraine and preached. It was not my strength. I experienced strength that was not mine. I'm usually could get so tired, so exhausted. I was able to minister. I was able to finish that fast all the way till the end. I actually finished it in Florida on the conference where I preached. I did look like a skeleton or like a, like a survival of some kind of a terminal disease though. But nevertheless, and I looked back at it, when the Holy Spirit leads you to a place like the cross, self-denial, He will give you the strength. And most importantly, He will take you to a new level after that. 
he will take you like Jesus when he came back from the dead he no longer you know was the same Jesus disciples witnessed before and so I want to encourage you because a lot of people they think the Holy Spirit only leads them or guides them or speaks to them about things like you know gives them a prophetic word to somebody in a drive-thru about the healing or gives them a vision or gives them who their wife is gonna be where they're gonna live who's gonna give them money and everything but about wilderness about the cross a lot of us don't want to hear about that or about fasting or about self-denial turn that off that that's not good for you end this relationship you know we're like well it's gonna take me through excruciating pain but you must understand by the spirit Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice and then David read that Holy Spirit raised him from the dead we always want to claim the resurrection but many of us, we skip <laughs> wow. the crucifixion wow. initiated by the Holy Spirit. And some of you may be watching this and you're saying, the Spirit of God never leads me to crucifixion. He can't lead you to crucifixion if He never led you through wilderness. He can't lead you through crucifixion if He led you through wilderness and you walked away and you denied that. If you never allowed Him to lead you being anchored in the Holy Scriptures being anchored in your ministry to people by the power of the Holy Spirit. I really believe Je you, you don't see Jesus being led through the to the crucifixion in the beginning stages of his ministry. It was later. I believe as you deepen in your relationship with the Holy Spirit, as you go in your obedience to the Holy Spirit, he will always, the mark of Spirit-filled life is crucified life. If you decline the crucified life, the alternative is going to be carnal life. It's either carnal or crucified. But the crucified life is not you copying the preacher. Oh, Vlad fasted this much days. I must fast. No, no, no. That's not being led by the Holy Spirit. That's being led by Vlad. Oh, this person gave this. I must do that. Unless the Spirit of God quickens that in you and you know that you know it's the Holy Spirit, it leads you through the cross I can assure you the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead will raise you up as well if He was the one that initiated your crucifixion. I love that you said that the Holy Spirit will lead you to do what you do. And here's the reality. The Holy Spirit won't challenge you to do things that's difficult for someone else to do. The Holy Spirit will always challenge you to do things that are difficult mm. for you to do. If I will do the difficult, God will do the impossible. If I will do the difficult, God will do the impossible. So now, mm. transitioning here, I want to talk to you about how to receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. We'll take a few minutes with that. Before I do, I want to read some of your comments. If this is blessing you, just type the number one in the chat. And I want to see us just, I want a flood of ones coming in. We have almost 1,600 people joining us now from all around the world, which, again, these are new spheres that we're coming to. Again, only eight weeks of doing this, and you guys are already getting us to about you know, almost 1,600 concurrent viewers. So we appreciate you guys. We, we, we're in a new time slot, new format, eight weeks of this, and we're very excited to see how fast this is growing. I mean, it went from like, Two, three hundred, then five or six hundred, then thousand, then it was averaging about twelve hundred, and now we're at almost <laughs> sixteen hundred here. So look at all these ones coming in. And I say that people say, Why are you so excited about numbers? I'm excited mm -hmm. about numbers because numbers mean people and people Come mean on. souls. It's not just sixteen hundred, oh wow, look how cool that looks on our stats. It's sixteen hundred. That's people's lives that are being transformed, that are hearing about the Holy Spirit. This means that almost 1,600 people, I mean, not even counting what's on your stream right now, Pastor Vlad, are receiving what they need to go and be empowered and live in the power of the Holy Ghost. Come so I'm on. very excited about that. Um, and then Vlad just texted me. He said, you broke 900 on his. So really, it's uh, over, over 2,000 people joining us right now. So this is just beautiful. And we're very excited about what the Lord is doing. But... 
That's why I'm excited about numbers. So please don't, and, uh, Vlad and I are not clout chasers or anything like that. We, we love numbers because we love people Come and on. people are being reached and all glory belongs to Jesus. Nobody's tuning in to see David Diga Hernandez or Vlad Sofchuk. You're tuning in for the word and the power of the Holy Ghost and we give all the glory to God. So we're very excited about that. Um, and we've been seeing that growth in our live stream. Thanks, Pastor Vlad, in part to some of the advice that you gave us for the live stream. So thank you. Uh, but anyway, uh, we actually did take a season as a ministry where we started consulting with like a, about a dozen other ministries mm -hmm. saying, how do we, how do we fine tune our live stream? We got the other stuff down. We needed to fine tune live stream and thank God for brothers mm -hmm. and sisters in Christ who come along you and help support. So how to receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Keep in mind that the same Holy Spirit in Acts 2 is the same Holy Spirit in Genesis 1-2. I alluded earlier to a portion of scripture found in Isaiah chapter 6, and Isaiah was given instruction telling him to go and preach to a people who would not hear him. Imagine receiving that instruction for the Lord. He tells you, go do your ministry, but it's not going to be effective. He tells Isaiah, go tell people who aren't going to listen. Go try to show something to people who aren't going to look. And then Isaiah 6 is quoted again in Acts chapter 28. And the scripture says that it was, in fact, the Holy Spirit said to Isaiah. So it was the Holy Spirit at work through the prophets. It's the same Holy Spirit all throughout the scripture. Now, the Holy Spirit was always and is always working in the earth. He did not arrive in Acts chapter 2. He came as a mighty rushing wind. He presented tongues of fire. He filled God's people for the purpose of evangelism. But he didn't just arrive on the scene in Acts 2. So you go to Genesis. He's there hovering above the face of the deep. The Holy Spirit was in Joseph the dreamer. Gave him interpretations that allowed people to hear messages from heavenly places. The Holy Spirit gave Samson strength. He would come upon Samson to give him physical strength. So there was different manifestations of the Holy Spirit's power all throughout the Old. And, of course, through the New Testament, New Testament as well. So... Let's start here thinking about the 72 disciples who Jesus sent out. And he said, cast out devils, heal the sick, preach the gospel, go and spread the good news. How, in fact, did they go and do that, if not by the power of the Holy Ghost? I mean, we just read that Jesus did all those things by the power of the Holy Ghost. So why wouldn't the same be true of the 72 disciples? So, in fact, the 72 were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then you take a look over at what happened with the 12 disciples. They too were empowered by the Holy Spirit. And then John chapter 20, verse 22, you quoted this scripture earlier, Pastor Vlad. John 20, 22 tells us that Jesus breathes on his disciples and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did not they have the Holy Spirit if they're casting out devils and healing the sick? Well, of course they did. So Jesus breathes on them for what? For something new. The Holy Spirit came on the disciples to carry out the work of the gospel. Then the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples when Jesus breathes on them. What were they empowered to do? They were empowered to wait. And then you look in Acts chapter 2. This very same group of disciples now in Acts chapter 2 are waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit to move. And then what happens? The Holy Spirit comes. Acts 1.8, but ye shall receive power... After the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my what? Witnesses. So the Holy Spirit comes upon them for evangelism. Fast forward two chapters down. Now you're in Acts chapter four. And you see that again, the believers have a prayer meeting. And the believers, Peter and James among them, received, or Peter and John, excuse me, received the power of the Holy Spirit in a fresh way. Now, wait a minute. The Holy Spirit was at work in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit was at work in the 72. The Holy Spirit came upon the disciples in John 20, 22. The Holy Spirit came upon the same disciples in Acts chapter 2. Then the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples again in Acts 4. And the scripture says, then they began to preach with boldness. Then they began to work miracles. That's a demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power all throughout. So the Holy Spirit... His influence is constant. Now, wait a minute. How then are we to receive the Holy Spirit? Watch this in Ephesians 5.18. 
Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this phrase, be filled, in the original language, implies a continual infilling. See, we imagine filled like I fill a, 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 a you know, jug of water. That's one form of filling that the Holy Spirit does. But in this portion of scripture, it's not be filled as in fill up that cup with water. It's in fill that wind, fill that sail with wind. It's a continual flow of the Holy Spirit. So then the flow of the Holy Spirit is both a well and a river. It's both a one-time static experience and it's a continual state of being. So how then do you receive that baptism? Well, there are many infillings of the Holy Spirit. I have him. He's filled my spirit. I'm one with him. He begins to touch my life, change those things about me, but he can fill my day. He can fill my words. Think about when Peter was speaking to a sorcerer, the scripture says, and, and him, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, he speaks. Why? Because that fresh power came on him, that fresh unction. So he speaks with that fresh touch of God's power on his life. It's another infilling. So we can't imagine that these disciples received the Holy Spirit again and again all throughout scripture. Rather, it's not that they received more of the Holy Spirit. It's that the Holy Spirit received more of them as they surrendered. The key to experiencing the baptism with the Holy Spirit is surrender. It's giving your life to him. It's yielding those things that, that you fight to keep. Unforgiveness, secret sin, compartments of your mind that you keep for yourself. Give it all to him. And it's so tempting to try to withhold that. But that's where surrender comes in. Pastor Vlad, you know that surrender is so key to receiving that fresh touch of the Holy Spirit's power, that baptism, that infilling, that continual day-to-day -day flow of God's Holy Spirit's power. Mm -hmm. You know, I find it interesting, David, in Acts chapter 2, verse 2, it says this, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and filled the whole house where they, and this is the word that caught my attention, where they were sitting, mm -hmm. not kneeling and not standing. The word sitting indicates like I'm sitting right now. The guys that are in front of me are standing. So they're taking the, you know, it's a lot more heavy. It's harder. I'm relaxed. And one of the things that I teach people all the time in receiving the baptism with the Holy Spirit is that you have to, yes, receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But the second thing is you have to relax. One of the challenges that happens is when you overthink, when you get all worked up, um, when you begin to, like, it almost feels like you're birthing something. You're not producing anything. You're... Uh, you know, one of the explanations, David, and you really helped me to articulate it now when I pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that you don't get it from there. Mm -hmm. You get it from here. And you don't have to receive it. You release it. The river is there. It's like water connected to your house. You just have to open the faucet and the water begins to flow. Wow. And so, so the, the idea to, to surrender is you, you give your mind a break. It doesn't mean you turn off your mind. You just put your mind on the back seat and then you relax and you just allow what's from your spirit, the syllables, the sounds that are from your spirit, the, the Holy Spirit who lives in your spirit to flow out without you filtering without your preferences, without you trying to control it, conjure up, make things up, and uh, kind of navigate that and allow the Holy Spirit to take control. And, you know, I always, one of my ways that we do it in our church is we just give everyone David Diga's book on praying in the Holy Spirit. There's that chapter on the baptism of the Holy Spirit that is so profound. And there's a message that, David, you did at our church, but I know it's also on your YouTube channel on praying in the Holy Spirit. I feel like the explanation that you give, um, it even clarified things in my mind. I've sent it to our team eventually as well. And I was like, hey, guys, I want you to watch this and listen to this because it makes it so much easier. 
if I would have known that at the age of 13, you know, it wouldn't take me six months to receive uh, the gift of speaking in tongues. I would have spoken it right away. But because of so many complications here in my head, and you really kind of destroy that. And so, and one of the things is, is that posture of rest, the posture of relaxing, the posture of surrender is al what allows the Holy Spirit to flow. And of course, the posture of trust, you do have to, I like how you say it, and I'm just gonna copy your terminology because I've been copying that everywhere now, is that I released the sound trusting God to add meaning to it. You know, I released the sound trusting the Holy Spirit adds meaning to it and so because it's really what it is those of us who speak in tongues it's not that the bible says be filled it doesn't say that you know spirit just takes over you it's not witchcraft you know he doesn't control us he leads he doesn't drive we're not a cattle we're not a vehicle we're people he leads he he gently guides us and so he fills us and then we let go and for some of us it's very hard to let go because we're always controlling everything and we want to control the Holy Spirit. We want to control what comes out and what happens. And so you just have to let go and surrender. So we're going to pray right now. Come on. You receive a fresh touch of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Some of you, this will be the first time you sense this or experience this. Others, it will be um, the, the uh, refreshing. Mm. But you know... You have to first realize, number one, realize that I already have him. So good. Number two, and this is probably the most difficult part. Number two, you do have to relax. <laughs> Some people are so worked up. I prayed for people to receive it, and they're going, Father God, Father God, Father God, Father God, Father God. I said, just, 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 just relax. Lift your hands. Ask him to fill you. Trust that he will. Release the syllables and sounds. That's mm. number three. Release. Release the syllables and the sounds. And trust that the Holy Spirit. Number four, rely on him. Rely on him to fill that. He says, is it just going to be me? Partially. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing spiritual that we do that doesn't require our participation. The Holy Spirit isn't going to come grab your tongue, move it up and down by your surprise. Mm. Everything that God does to us requires our participation if we are to yield to it. And so speaking in tongues is the same thing. Now, baptism with the Holy Spirit isn't speaking in tongues. But speaking in tongues comes about as a result of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. So, number one, realize. Realize that you have the Holy Spirit. So good. No need to beg. Number two, relax. Stop complicating it. Stop overthinking it. Stop saying, is this just me? Is this the devil? I'm just making this up. Is God going to be mad at me? Just relax. Number two or number three, release. Release that sound. Let the Holy Spirit fill it. And number four, rely on the Holy Spirit to fill those sounds with his spirit. So, Pastor Vlad, why don't you pray for those watching who want to receive A, a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit's power, mm -hmm. and B, who want to release that gift of tongues. Amen. Those of you who are watching right now, just wherever you are at, the Spirit of the living God is right there. He lives within you. He desires to give you this more than you desire to receive it. Mm. And He loves you. He chose to be with you, to dwell with you. His temple his mailing address is your body. He absolutely wants to fill you right now. And all you got to do, this, this is not a barrier. When the power of God came upon the elders of Israel and some didn't make it to the assembly, maybe they had COVID or something, I don't know, they couldn't make it to the in-person service. The same power that visited people in person service touched them. So distance is not a barrier to the Holy Spirit. You may say, well, it's just a virtual, no distance to the Holy Spirit. He's a spirit. And what makes him a spirit is he's not limited by space. And he's not limited by time, meaning if you will be re-watching this, the same thing will happen to you. So there where you are, just, just say this very simple prayer. Yes. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, I surrender to you. Baptize me 
into the Holy Spirit. Jesus. Fill me till I overflow. In Jesus' name. And right now, I receive the infilling yes. of the Holy Spirit. And right now, as I release the sounds from my spirit, from my belly, I trust you will add meaning to them. In Jesus' name. So precious Amen. Lord, we Let's thank receive. you that your power is present. And Father, I join my faith with that one believing now to receive that fresh touch of your power. Father, we release the anointing of the Holy Ghost now. Yes. Holy Spirit, I pray, move through my hands. Move through that lens. Ride across the screen of that one believing. Let them begin to sense your presence and power like never before. Now, what I want you all to do is to begin, as we're praying now, I want you to begin to type in your, your, your prayer requests right here. And even if I don't see it, the community of believers around the world will see it. Someone is bound to see it. This many people watching, someone will see your prayer request. And what I want you to do, if you're not putting a prayer request, start praying over the prayer request that you see coming in. Come on, right now. Put the names of unsaved loved ones. Put, put, put what you need healing from. Put what you need deliverance from. Put what you need God to do in your life. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or even imagine. Right now, join your faith with ours. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that your power is moving. We thank you, Lord, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, that we don't need to beg. We don't need to strive. We surrender to you and we love you. And we honor you and we bless you. Father, I pray for healing power to begin to flow. I rebuke sickness right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, begin to open eyes and ears. I rebuke that tumor in the name of Jesus. I rebuke that sickness in the name of Jesus. Skin disorder, I rebuke mm. it in Jesus' name. Healing right now, begin to flow. Someone, someone on the upper part of your spine, and there was something that happened two days ago, two days ago, and it's really, really severe pain. Mm. The Lord is touching your body right now. I thank you, Jesus. We give you the glory, Lord. Someone else I see in the Spirit your your feet are turned inward, like like your posture, your your stance is 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 not proper, and it's, it's, there's something to do with the structure in your legs. Lord, give them a creative miracle right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord. We give you the glory, Jesus. Mm -hmm. We pray for deliverance, Lord. Break every addiction. I pray in the name of Jesus. Break every bondage. Shatter every stronghold. We thank you, Jesus, that you are delivering your people from that which binds them. In the name of Jesus, we give you glory and honor, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The anointing is flowing right now, really heavy. Just receive the touch of the Holy Spirit. Even on the replay, even if you're not watching this live, there's a tangible touch on this right now. God, I give you the praise. I give you the praise. Fill their rooms, Lord. Fill their room with the power of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, we pray. I want you all to say it because you believe it. Say amen. Now, amen. before I get into the Q&A, I want to read a portion of Scripture to you. We're going to get into the questions and answers in a moment. And Pastor Vlad will be here with me to help with the Q&A. John 3.16 says this. For this is how God loved the world. Oh, I love this. Mm. He gave his one and only son mm. so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Do you realize that God gave his son Jesus to us for the purpose of saving and redeeming us? Think of the selflessness. And think of the selflessness of Jesus, the word to mm. come to earth, to give up the comforts mm -hmm. and the authority and the praises that come in heavenly places and to come into this world and experience the world as we live in it mm. pain suffering
chaos all around. And he came because he loves us. Yes. To reach us, to reach that one. When God.